Well, this is Joyce May. I'm going to start again. <laughs> but Aisha Pa, hello everybody. This is Joyce Mendes from the SDG 7 Youth Constituency. And I'm just greeting you and I'm very happy to be here with you all. Um, welcome to the webinar series, Empowering Youth for COP27, Inspiring Climate Action. So those series are organized in preparation to the 27th Conference of Parties to be held in Egypt in November. UNIDO Climate Parliament and Egypt's National Institute for Governance for Sustainable Development are launching this five webinar series, Empowering Youth um, for COP27 and Inspiring Climate Actions. Uh, the goal basically is to build capacity and engagement of youth from the region, understanding the terminology and also the main climate issues with a focus on the nexus with industry and innovations. Today's webinar is the fourth of this series and is about um, obviously towards COP27, but climate justice and why gender equality and women's empowerment matter in the climate change, in climate change. So we will introduce basically to our amazing speakers that they will approach the gender dimensions of climate change and explain why they are key in enhancing gender equality and women's empowerment while combat and combating and adapting to climate change. As well, we will talk and, and reflect more about this gender um, and energy nexus, showing that access and control over sustainable energy is crucial to leave no one behind. So we're going to have presentations, interactive presentations, but also we're going to have a Q and interactive uh, Q&A session. Um, so in order to get it started and to give us the welcome remarks for this webinar, um, I want to invite engineer Arm Soliman from the National Council for uh, Women in Egypt to just uh, welcome us uh, and to let's get started into this webinar. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable attendees, distinguished guests, all the young generation. Good morning, everyone from sunny Cairo. Uh, I believe we are uh, here to basically discuss why is it key uh, to enhance gender equality and uh, women empowerment while combating and adapting to climate change in the years to come. Uh, I do represent the National Council for Women. You heard that right. I sit on the board for almost five years and I actually head the Economic and Environment Committee. And basically uh, we've been doing a lot of work around this area, but let me tell you, apart from all the existing gender inequalities that we all know about today, be it limited access to control over different kinds of resources or unequal uh, unpaid care burden, limited economic opportunities, violence against women and girls, higher literacy rates, all these issues that we've all been discussing, but now we have even a bigger issue on hand. And I believe we are very much uh, 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 believing that women will have a very important role to play in the years to come in the climate challenge that we are all facing around the globe. Uh, certainly, there are health-related issues uh, that also get affected by climate change. So there's very important issues here that we need to look into. Uh, certainly, specific women segments face compounded consequences, certainly uh, women with disabilities, rural women, women living in impacted geographical areas, uh, like coastal areas or fisheries and so on and so forth. So the, the, the audience is diverse and the impact is, is also diverse. However, why do we see women as actually being the, um, uh, the agent of change for this uh, challenge. Primarily, uh, women manage household resources and influence consumption habits to the whole family. And that means that they can also shape next generation's consumption habits and adoption of eco-friendly lifestyles. With adequate awareness, and with uh, basic information and accessing this kind of information, we have seen that women are very fast adopters, uh, very diligent and very uh, uh, meticulous in terms of adopting new ideas and trying to evolve with that. So finally, also we see that women in leadership must play a very important role because certainly without having women in boards, women in policy reform, then we will not also have uh, uh, that dimension in the uh, boardrooms where the regulations are being constructed uh, uh, to come to a just uh, green revolution. So um, finally, um, before uh, going on to the, um, uh, what, has, what have we done or what has Egypt actually put on the table as 
uh, our perspective for a global perspective for women going forward, although, although that Egypt is among actually one of the most affected countries by the implications of climate change. And despite its very limited contribution to that and to many, and also as long with other countries, but again, I believe this is a commitment from the state, from the people uh, that uh, we do want a different style and different type of life. We have seen the impact, the bad impact that we've seen in the past, and now it's time to move forward. So basically, we have, uh, we have come up with sort of a, a, um, a very um, uh, global perspective for women, as I said, and basically through seven action, actionable areas or items that we can address. Primarily, we need to promote gender sensitive perspectives within adaptation, mitigations and responses, basically to apply gender mainstreaming tools and techniques. So basically to avoid and to capitalize on environmental governance there. Secondly, you need the voice, you need women's voice and their meaningful participation. We don't need to actually tell them what to do, we need to listen. So there needs to be a, a voice and many platforms where we can actually integrate and, and, and talk and discuss. We certainly need to leverage opportunities for women within the just environmental transition because the movement that will happen certainly will create a lot of opportunities. And in that said, saying that, I believe that this will also uh, uh, come with a lot of uh, uh, um, change to the women's lives if we avail such opportunities. The, as I said, we need to tackle differential health and social implications of environmental issues also and the impact on access to health services. That's something that we should always have an eye on. We need to promote educational behavior change on women and climate change on, on climate change. We need to promote knowledge. We need to have data generation. We're living in an era of technology and analysis on women and climate change. This is accessible. We, we should accumulate or accumulate all this data. We have so much information. We're talking about COP27. There has been 26 COPs before. I don't know how many of you were with COP25 or COP20 or maybe COP6. I don't know. But certainly it's something that has taken the world by storm. And I believe it's time that we put all our heads together. So again, without economies of scale without something being profitable and economical. We have seen so much incredible innovations in the past for green, sustainable types of projects, but we have also seen a very bad numbers on the profitability side and, and all that. So again, this is a challenge, but what I see happening now is the change that is taking place with the change of regulations. As I said, a lot of opportunities come and enforcements arrive. And that means that the economies of scale will differ. So that will certainly impact the economics of things. And this, I believe, will take us to a different playground where, than where we, are, where we were 10 years ago until uh, uh, the few last years. Uh, finally, uh, our generation, when we grew up, we witnessed the great impact of technology. Technology that came and disrupted everything around us, everything. And from that, including ourselves actually, without notice of the negative impact and implications that is actually bringing with it. Today, I am betting that your generation will not only witness, but will be able to harness this incredible technology to safeguard our planet and to create a paradigm shift to a more green, sustainable way of life, inclusive of women and men and everyone on that planet. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for having me. I'll hang around if there are any questions later on. Good morning from Sunny Car. Thank you very much, engineer. And I was actually thinking about the cops um, COP27 is my age and it's like it's been 27 years so we obviously need to be more ambitious but also I, I'm sorry I, I'm sorry Joyce I just had to say I would like to say that also I look very forward to receiving everyone to their participation in COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in uh, November sunny Sharm el Sheikh beautiful place and if you can't come in person please join I'm sure there are a lot of uh, uh, ways you can join uh, through virtual uh, communication Thank you, Joyce. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Well, Thank you, Nido, for having me and looking forward to hear the distinguished guests. 
thank you very much. And I think this, um, what you comment regarding gender sensitive perspectives are fundamental. And those are the ones that we'll be exploring as well today. So, okay, let's continue. In order to set in this scene, um, I want to invite Amira Hagani, scientist and, clim uh, and a climate justice organizer. Um, how are you doing today, Mrs. Mira? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I am very happy to be here. Um, I, as Amir said, I've been doing the COP circuit for over 20 years. So, um, so um, have some experience with that. But uh, for me, I think my main kind of um, work that I've been doing is around organizing and um, talking about maybe climate justice in different ways. So I'm very happy to be here um, and hear what Thank others you. have to say. Brilliant. So let's just start talking about like what's climate justice and what does entail from a climate justice organized point of view from a global political standpoint, as well from a scientific lens. Oh, thank you so much for that question. So for me, um, when I think about climate justice or when I talk about climate justice, I kind of reframe um, what we understand uh, by the climate crisis. So uh, my starting point is a bit different. We always see the climate crisis as something external, something that causes, of course, extreme weather events, and it causes a lot of disasters. My country just faced a great climate disaster, one of the biggest disasters that we've seen in recent history. Pakistan, one third of it is underwater with uh, over 33 million people displaced internally. So of course it is a matter of injustice because as you know, Pakistan um, has um, cumulative 0.098% um, of the emissions of the global emissions, but um, is facing the most dire impacts. So there is disproportional impact on um, who is um, creating the emissions and who is impacted by them. But for me, the starting point isn't the emissions because if we just look at the industrialization process and the rapid growth in some economies and the rapid growth in consumption and production patterns, um, there's an inequity that is seeded um, uh, within the systems that we have um, that led to the manifestation of the crisis. So for me, the starting point is actually colonization. And due to colonization and due to the extraction and exploitation, extraction of wealth, extraction of um, resources um, and the exploitation of labor that was already happening made countries like mine vulnerable to what led, what is now what we see as climate impacts and the climate crisis. So there's an existing inequity that makes communities and certain populations and certain regions vulnerable. And it's the same thing when it comes to uh, women and gender minorities. So women, trans, non-binary people, um, and also children, elderly and disabled. And it's really, really important to see um, inequities with the intersectional perspective, intersection in the, the framework of intersectionality comes from um, US American black scholar, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, but it is very, very important and it gives us perspective um, on how to understand the climate crisis because it's a crisis of multiple things happening at the same time. So we cannot isolate the climate crisis from other existing crises that are, we are seeing, the crisis of inequity, the crisis of uh, the wars we're in, the crises of overconsumption, the crises of um, different um, pandemics. Um, so what happened, what we saw happen uh, during the COVID ongoing COVID pandemic, uh, which is going on for over three years, we're seeing similar patterns of inequity and the kind of communities that are impacted by these inequities. And because they're already um, um, historically marginalized and oppressed and excluded um, from uh, society's services and have barriers, certain structural and institutional barriers, uh, in participating to society as others would, it also makes um, being adapting, uh, adapting to climate change more difficult for these communities. So while these communities are resilient, for me, it's really important to understand the starting point of the climate crisis. If we understand the starting point, we'll then understand how to get to justice. 
And to get to justice, it means that we talk to the people and make processes inclusive of people most impacted by the crisis and other systems of oppression. Once we center the voices, the needs of people, and people understand their needs, local communities, people who are impact, impacted by the climate crisis understand their needs, have the solutions already. We don't need to bring and present them solutions. They have their own solutions. We just need to listen to them and make sure that there is seat at the decision-making tables for them to make decisions that impact their lives. So in terms of Pakistan, for example, we're seeing that there was no way, even if there are certain um, inadequacies in the way our government um, handled the crisis, handled the floodings, um, with this kind of flooding and these kind of climate disasters, it's difficult to even for the best countries with the be uh, most developed rich countries like Japan having the best infrastructure in place, it's difficult to deal with the violence of waters that come like that. So, um, of course, adaptation is needed, but what's needed more is how to deal with these impacts. And with colonization comes the question of reparations. And with that, um, I'll maybe talk about it later, comes the question of loss and damage, which I'm hoping that the Egyptian COP will be about. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. I think it is it is fundamental. And myself, as an urban indigenous person, I always realize in my family nowadays as well. I live in the, in the Amazon, and um, and as you said, this relationship as well, as well with colonialism, obviously the past, and even loss and damage. This is like part as well of the impacts of climate change, and and they are completely related to the socioeconomic and global inequalities that you have explored as well, like impacted directly indigenous marginalized uh, communities. So also, like I, I want to ask you, how is climate change uh, justice addressed in the in the climate agreement, and how will climate justice will be addressed at COP twenty seven? Um, and explore a little bit about uh, loss and damage, please. Thank you. Thank you so and, much. And also, sorry, the global goal and adaptation. I think this is as well fundamental. Yes. Um, so there are various demands, like you've um, named them. So one is the global goal on adaptation. The other is loss and damage. The other is uh, the, the global quantified collective goal for finance post uh, 2025. We've still seen the 100 billion a year still missing. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what to expect from rich nations in terms of financing. But I think um, at the heart of the negotiations when it comes to climate justice, the way it's addressed within the UNFCCC and within that context is um, uh, in emphasizing on equity. So what does equity mean when it comes to the climate negotiations? What does historical responsibility and capability mean? And so uh, a way the question of colonization and historical cumulative emissions is addressed through historical responsibility and capability, something that um, rich nations really push back against, uh, being the top polluters, being the top cumulative polluters, being accountable for responsible for 92% of the historical cumulative emissions, they really deny their responsibility in creating the crisis. So I think at the heart of it is how do we address equity or inequity within the system? Because um, any kind of finance given to um, uh, countries in the global south, um, uh, countries who are part of um, G77 plus China, the AOSIS countries, the least developing countries, it's always seen as benevolence and charity instead of an act of solidarity for the harm already caused. So what we're asking for in terms of justice and in terms of moving towards what could be considered a part of climate justice, I think getting to climate justice would be giving land back, would be giving up power, would be a complete shift in how global systems work. It would be the dismantling of capitalism as a system uh, because within the capitalist system, it's very difficult to get to solutions that would lead to justice. So I don't think we're getting to any of that anytime soon, but within the negotiations in really emphasizing um, the importance of equity, the importance of historical responsibility and uh, capability, and really um, looking at the harm that's already happened. Loss and damage is a 
30 year demand. It was first put on the table in 1991. And it's still not, we still don't have a facility for loss and damage, which um, came up um, in Glasgow. There's, um, there's certain um, milestones that have happened in between, but we're nowhere near um, even getting the recognition of how great um, uh, an issue loss and damage is. So I think it's really, really important. Um, but I think today is a global call for action on loss and damage. Um, lots of civil society NGOs uh, from the global south and the global north are calling for that. They're calling for the Egyptian presidency to really take on loss and damage as something that is a, one of the key um, elements of the COP that will deliver a successful COP. So it's really, really important that we focus on um, on some of these demands that are not even just coming from the civil society, but are coming from delegations that are vulnerable. And um, Pakistan is going to be the chairing the G77 plus China. And um, it also held um, in New York at the UN NGA uh, an event on loss and damage. I think this as chair, they're also going to be putting this demand. So it's really about rethinking. And, re and also for me, it's about cultural shift. So changing our values, moving from, okay, yes, this happened in the past, but we're going to do this for you now. We're gonna give you technology, but with conditions, there are going to be patents. You can't produce the technology yourself. We're gonna give you money, but as loans, not as grants. So you're gonna to have to pay them back and then you're stuck in a debt cycle. So these kind of um, kind the systems that we're working within, we need a cultural shift. We need a shift in values. We need to move towards a solidarity with countries that are at the forefront of the climate crisis. Um, we need solidarity with the people and communities at the forefront of the crisis. And that includes uh, indigenous peoples from across the globe, that includes women, that includes trans people, that includes disabled people, that includes children, that includes uh, the LGBTQ community. So these are vulnerable populations um, and they're not vulnerable because it's something that they are not able to achieve. They're vulnerable because of the systems we're living in and those systems leave them out uh, of and from accessing um, their opportunities and resources. Um, so it's really, really important to address the inequity that exists within the system and move to this cultural shift of solidarity and care. I'll stop there. Happy to answer any questions later. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think you explore and um, you really set the scene with the, obviously with the vocabulary, with the perspectives, either how we will be addressing and those valuable recommendations regarding addressing um, e-equity um, at COP and beyond COP as well. It's fundamental to have this kind of paradigm shift as well to localize, you know, like the Paris Agreement and the negotiations back to our countries and back to our realities. And yes, indigenous peoples, we are very capable. We have a lot of knowledge that is not just in museums. Um, so yeah, let's let's continue the conversation. Thank you very much, Mira. Um, we will uh, we will start with part one, which is the role of youth in climate justice. For this, I want to uh, welcome Jessica Antonis, campaigner with the world's youth uh, for climate justice. Um, well, I'm so excited to see Jessica again. Uh, she's as well head of the UN delegation to G7 policy and advocacy coordinator at one uh, campaign. Welcome, Jessica. I hope you're doing okay. And I want to ask you directly, how are youth being affected by climate justice? What are those impacts and those dimensions in the different parts of the world? In the world? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so hi, everyone. Great to be here. And, and thanks for joining us uh, this morning for me from Brussels. Uh, so I'm Jessica. I'm with World's Youth for Climate Justice. And we have a big global campaign to take the world's biggest issue, climate change, to the world's highest courts, the International Court of Justice in The Hague, um, and to get an advisory opinion on the intersection between human rights and climate change. Um, and this movement was started in the Pacific actually by students there, and it's been brought forward to the UNGA. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm really excited also to talk more about this campaign to you guys and uh, hope on a lot of support. Um, 
as to your question, I'm really happy with the introduction by Mira, really excellent explanation of all the issues at stake um, and the different aspects of climate justice as well. Um, and I'll talk to you a bit about how that affects then youth as a group too. Um, I know you've heard all of this before, but climate change and the global warming and extreme weather events, the loss of biodiversity, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, it affects our lives directly. Um, and you often hear this when people talk about climate change, they say everyone will be affected by climate change, everyone will feel it, but not everyone will feel it the same way. And we've heard Mira just speak to this. Um, it is very different growing up in the Netherlands, like me, compared to growing up in Pakistan. And we've seen it with the uh, recent humanitarian crisis uh, that's coming up right now and human rights of those living on the front lines are directly violated. We're talking about rights such as a right to foods, to housing, um, to health, and the right to life. Um, so the human consumption has been out of bounds for a long time, mainly by the high income countries that have industrialized uh, because they were able to colonize countries, extract resources, emit CO2, create these crises. Uh, in a very short way, a summary of what we talk about. And youth are extremely affected by this um, directly because we are the ones having to live longest with this. I'm the same age as uh, Joyce. So the COP came into being when we were born. Um, it's been a long, long ongoing conversation. Um, and we know that in 20 years and 30 years, it will look a lot different and we are worried and we have to live with those consequences. Um, the Paris Agreement was uh, a key milestone, the 1.5 degrees to stave off the worst effects. Um, and like, uh, yeah, I think we all agree here. Young people are super engaged on the topic. They really know the science behind it. They do their research, they engage and talk on it. Um, but they have a very different economic and political position in this world. Uh, youth are underrepresented in political forum. Um, and when we talk about youth, it's also important to realize that about half of the world population is under 30. So we're talking about a really, really big group here. And only 2.6% of people under 30 are uh, parliamentarians are under 30. So we are really, really underrepresented there. Um, and the same economically, when you just start out and you want to have a good education and you want to get a job, you are in a very different position than you are. Uh, when you are a couple years older and you are able, for example, to move when a disaster happens. Um, so youth are in this, uh, yeah, not in this great position. Luckily, we are mobilizing. Um, and again, this looks different around the world. Europe actually is having an aging population. Um, but for example, on the African continent, the youth population is growing. Uh, and one estimation I saw around was that there's 15 million jobs needed. Uh, every year to harness this youth population and to provide everyone with a decent job. And um, there's huge potential for, for renewable energy, but also for adaptation projects to create these jobs and to have people um, in valuable positions um, for the transition that we need. Um, but for this, we need, we need a lot of action still. And for example, um, this was also touched upon, but we do need high income countries to deliver on the promises already made, such as a finance promise of 100 billion a year. That is not to say that 100 billion a year is enough. I think we've reached around 80 billion a year. Uh, and even if we provided now the total promise of 600 billion, it's not a number that will um, save us, let's say it like that. For example, the African group of negotiators is calling for 1.3 trillion which is much closer to the actual costs and needs. Um, and yeah, I also really appreciate it. The call to loss and damage, I actually wanted to mention it um, and I will touch upon it maybe uh, a bit later, but yeah, I hope I, I gave a good overview of the consequences for the youth population. Exactly, and I think that Sometimes it's even like, you know, sometimes it's like overwhelming is the reality. Like that's something that we have to deal with, especially as you have mentioned in Global South is climate change. Sometimes it's not an option. It is our only choice. And I also want to ask you to explore a little bit how like we youth can promote that climate justice, how we can become advocates of change 
and 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 how are, are like, can we be as well participating, you know, uh, promoting climate justice at COP27, kind of um, explore a little bit about the options that even people here uh, can be, you know, like, how can we be following the negotiations during COP27 and localizing that action back home? Yes, thank you. Um, so the young population is really key to climate justice because we make up half the population, but also because I think um, we are extremely well connected because of our access to internet and to social platforms. Um, but also I think that young people realize this global interconnectedness and our dependence. So what I do in my daily life impacts someone on the other side of the world and vice versa. Uh, and you've seen unprecedented youth movement and youth engagement in the, in the climate crisis, um, which is really great, really amazing to see. I wish it wasn't necessary, but at the same time, we are here with almost 200 people and you take the time to be here and um, get educated and get organized. So that's really, really amazing. And uh, yeah, again, thanks for also being here. Um, yeah, the COP26, I think it was also mentioned by uh, Mr. Soliman, uh, brought together over 30,000 people, which is really not uh, a general thing for UN conferences. Like these negotiations go on day and night. They can be very technical, very boring. There are many UN conferences that go by without this much interest of people. Um, but for COPs and for climate, it really uh, harnesses this. Um, and this is not because of our love for conferences, right? This is because young people lie awake at night thinking about the climate crisis, how it's going to affect their lives, their future, and those around them, um, and how to get people to spur into action. Um, so on that, I have three different ideas of things to do. And the one is uh, what you're doing right now, and that is to join movements and to organize and to educate uh, others and educate yourself. Um, there are a lot of really great movements out there. We don't need new ones. We need everyone to join the ones that exist. And uh, yeah, find one that fits with your beliefs. And there's a role for everyone also in all of these. Um, and an added benefit of these movements is that there are really great people in there. I've met some of my best friends uh, in the climate movement, and you're going to need each other as well. Um, so like Joyce said, it can be tough. It's a reality that we are in this and to engage every day on these topics and to keep advocating for them uh, while it affects directly your own life is really hard. Uh, but doing that in community and in groups can really help. Um, and you need to be in it for the long haul. We also talked about this, uh, but there was already an IPCC report in the 1990 that said that global warming will be um, one of the greatest global environmental challenges facing mankind. And this was years before I was born. Um, yeah, so we need to be in it for the long haul. And the second one is to uh, approach your local governments. I also realized that they are, um, the governments can be easier to approach or less e uh, easy to approach compared to where you live um, and realize that not for everyone that's super accessible, but your local governments and your um, local municipalities as well can really make an impact and start there. Um, I also say this because the system that we advise to address climate change within the COP is a conference of the parties and the parties in this case are your countries um, and one of the fragilities within the Paris Agreement is that it depends on nationally determined goals, um, contributions. So countries themselves determine the level of ambition and also basically check themselves. So we need young people to get into that conversation and urge their governments to have ambitious goals and to stick to them. Um, and the last point on that would be to be ready uh, once you get that seat at the table, because I completely agree that we need to have everyone in this conversation. If we do not, we are also not actually addressing the entire problem. If there are people missing around the table, you are missing parts of the problem, parts of the solution, and we have no way forward. Uh, but once you do get invited, I always also say, try to invite another person too. Don't... Um, accept one seat for young people, but try to create more, um, but also come prepared and have your message ready uh, when we do get asked for input. Um, 
Yeah, and then you asked me about direct access to the COP27 negotiations. I think it's a tough question because COPs are notoriously um, yeah, restricted and hard to, to access. And again, uh, here we see underrepresentation of people that come from climate vulnerable areas uh, and much more representation, for example, from European countries or American, North American countries, where people have full-time jobs where they are a negotiator and they are able to pay the cost for accommodation and stay much longer. These negotiations also tend to go much longer um, than the two weeks promised. And then there are delegations that already have to move home, for example, while others can keep going. Um, so access to these negotiations is really um, tricky and an issue. Um, the COP space is much bigger than the actual negotiations. So when I say that 30,000 people went to Glasgow, it doesn't mean that 30,000 people were in those restricted negotiations. You need a badge. Um, country delegations have those as well as accredited NGOs. Um, so reach out to NGOs and to your country delegation and um, vouch for a youth voice in those delegations. I know that a handful of countries have official UN delegation, uh, youth delegation delegates, um, but yeah, very little, but take this as an example and, and, and push for that as well. Um, and then you can definitely follow the negotiations online. Um, also a lot of events will be live streamed and speakers can be participating online. Um, yeah, so do your research. The last thing I'll say on this, join, Youngo, which is the youth constituency um, that has an email group that keeps you updated on all of this and a few opportunities, for example, to input where uh, a written input for the youth statement, as well as a proposal to uh, host an event in the youth pavilion at COP. So those are some concrete opportunities to, um, yeah, to get involved. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I think that like, the, the, the fact obviously of, of, of networking and working in community that's the the way we can leverage and we can you know like expand climate justice and climate action um and and i think youth we are very good at doing this um as well it's very important to um say again obviously like we're gonna have the youth and and children pavilion at cop we're gonna have hybrid uh like uh, programs online uh, so try to join, um, follow as well, kind of uh, these international uh, youth organizations in order to ensure as well that your voice will be represented. And what's important as well is, as you mentioned, to be ready to understand what's happening, to, to read the indices of your country, to enter in contact, but to, to work on this with your uh, community. I just want to remind the participants to ask questions through the Q&A option here in Zoom. We will be answering them at the end as well. I have seen some of the uh, lecturers, they have been answering already, which is really appreciated. Uh, so next we're going to move to part two, which is gender dimensions of climate change in gender responsive climate action. For this, I want to invite to the stage Ms. Moana Hamisi Singano, representing Women's Environment and Development Organization for Women and Gender Constituency and the African Feminist Tax Force for COP27. Uh, Ms. Singano, thank you very much for uh, being with us. And I also want to introduce with a question, how is gender related to climate change and to the, and the climate justice uh, movement? Thank you so much uh, for having me. And I'm also very excited to be part of this conversation. I think it's a very timely conversation. So just to go directly to your question, uh, I think and I strongly believe that at the heart of the climate crisis we are witnessing now is the question of injustice. And I think this has been said uh, by the first speaker and the second and everyone. I think we all agree that injustice, it is the heart of the climate change crisis that we are witnessing right now. Unfortunately, we live in a world where those who are responsible for creating this climate emergency are better equipped to deal with it. And those who have contributed the least uh, have the least 
uh, ability to deal with it. And this, as it has been said earlier, uh, this is because of the systematic structural and historical discrimination and exploitation. And this is true uh, if you look, for example, on the reality between global north and global south, if you look the reality between urban and rural, if you look at the reality between Within the urban center, for example, uh, if you look uh, urban middle class with the be urban poor, uh, if you look between men and women, able and differently abled people, binary and non-binary person, adult and youth, and the list goes on. So we have created a world where uh, this uh, a few group who created, who are powerful, can uh, um, contribute to this crisis while others bear the brand of it. So unfortunately, again, uh, this economic, social, and political aspect determine one, who own resources, two, who own knowledge, and three, who makes decision. And sadly, those who are positioned at the periphery of power are constantly considered as less knowledgeable, unable to lead, or considered poor, even though the reality is, it has been said, that often than not, their resources have been grabbed from them. And it becomes worse when this identity intersect. So for example, if you find to meet a non-binary young black person living in a rural village, clearly they carry far heavier brand of climate crisis than for example, a middle-class man. And that is why for us as feminists, we strongly and constantly believe that we need to change all this system of, of oppression that constantly interact itself. Uh, and that includes patriarchy, capitalism, neoliberalism, racism, and all other related system of oppression. And we need to center gender at the heart of climate justice processes, but also climate justice movement because it intersects with everything else. So much important concepts. I hope you're digesting this because whenever we were talking as well about system, uh, this oppression system as well, I, I think as, as a young uh, woman, um, indigenous person, um, like, you know, getting involved with climate justice, it, it, it wasn't easy at first as well, you know, to recognize, to acknowledge, but to, you know, set uh, the, the, like a talk with as well um, the different stakeholders. So what, what would you say that is the role of young women in climate justice and, and, and kind of what, what is your advice for, for young women as well during this, this, in, in this event regarding this, these matters? I think um, I'm, I'm not young, <laughs> but uh, I, I think most of us who are not so young already know that across the world, young women has demonstrated exceptional leadership in fighting against climate change. Uh, and we know that for the fact because most of them, they have outsmarted us, the, the level of energy that they bring, the creativity, and the level of being unapologetical about uh, addressing this issue. I think they have demonstrated exceptional leadership. And I, I strongly feel while we, some of us can know few names like the Greta or Vanessa, Rest to be assured, there are hundreds of thousands of young girls who refuse to be passive object of the future uh, because we constantly tell them you are the future. And we have seen young women refusing to be passive object of the futures. They did not accept that they, are, they will continue to be a mere statistics and the hopeless victim of the crisis that they have not created. And for that, they have taken on themselves to provide that leadership and showing us uh, with evidence. And by doing it, this is how climate leadership should look like. So in so many ways, young women have demonstrated the possibilities of how to address climate change and all of us need to, to learn from them. So if there's any advice that I need to give young people, which I don't think I need to give because they are supposed to advise us, 
it's just to say, do what you are doing because it's working. And if there is advice to all, most of us who, for example, belong to women movement, because even within the women movement is a struggle to get young women to be in the, uh, in the women movement or to be in the climate crisis movement, I mean, climate justice movement. So advice to some of us is to step back and let uh, young women lead. Exactly, fundamental. And um, I, I, I think that the question is that uh, we will be, you know, uh, talking all, a lot. I'm sorry for the noise, <laughs> countryside life. Anyway, um, regarding um, the intersection in, about gender and climate justice, and we will be talking a little bit in, um, about how we'll be addressed in COP27 Charmel Shaikh. Um, what is your, um, you know, opinion and perspective regarding this point? Thank you. So I think as a feminist, uh, I think first, I, we just have to acknowledge that COP has never been a feminist space, uh, uh, but it's, it's the space that we have to address the climate crisis. So we engage in that space aware and mindful that this is not a feminist space. And it's not the space that power is being shared. Uh, it's not the space that really respect human rights. That's the only space that we had. But also I should note that unfortunately of recent years, we have seen massive influx of private interest in the COP processes, which ought to be a party-driven process. And often the not, this influx of private interest come in the expense of uh, participation of women and young people. I'll give you an example. Uh, as we do, we provide uh, statistics every year on how COP have, uh, have been delivered. We launch a report uh, June this year at the margin of the SB, and our report shows that between 2009 to 2021, the increase of uh, women participation in national delegation in meeting was only 8%. We had 30% women engaging in 2009, and we have 38% engaging in 2020. So this 80% increase is less than 1% per year increase, despite uh, decision that we have made uh, in, in several COP. And also, what was also disturbing to know that within 10 years, the head of delegation who are women, the increase was only 3%. We have 10% of head delegation uh, being women in 2009, and we have 13% of women being head of delegation in 2021. So three years increase in 10 years is alarming. And this is, uh, this is why we're saying that the influx of private keep on squeezing the already uh, 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 minimal shrinking space. And what also was interesting to note when we did this analysis is in 2015, when uh, we we are leading COP twenty uh, COP twenty one, which was decisive COP. The head of delegation uh, sort of dropped to nine percent, and this says a lot on how government also looking at women leadership when it's a is the time to make strong decision. Then you need men leadership and not female leadership. So it speaks a lot to how systematic uh, the position of women has been. But we do believe, uh, especially when we go to uh, to the Chanel Sheikh, we do expect uh, government first to recommit on addressing gender gap. Uh, that one. And second, this year marked the midterm review of uh, gender action plan. So they have already, secretariat have already launched several reports. Member states have been invited to submit their submission. And the discussion has started during the SB. Unfortunately, parties couldn't agree in the text. But during Shamal Sheikh, we're really looking forward to see government recommitting resources and recommitting the ambition to ensure that we close the gender gap, but may also making sure that gender is mainstreamed across all different strands of uh, free enterprise. Exactly. I think it's a very clear message. And um, I hope I was like, like that we come like with specific outcomes out of the COP as well, but as well as um, maybe like uh, how like um, civil society, young women, we will be happy to localize again this this agenda back in our communities back in our villages and those spaces are fundamental to share those perspectives 
those are global challenges that we are facing. Um, and, and also um, in order to have as well a transition to the part three that is about uh, climate finance, I want to ask you, um, what is a gender responsive climate action and is there enough funding available um, for this? Definitely you don't have enough funding available. Uh, and I think this is well documented and there's enough statistics to show uh, how much goes to uh, women's led organization and climate funding, uh, specifically on project which primarily focus on gender. So the funding has not been available to support gender standalone project, but also to support, even to support mainstreaming of, of gender. Um, what we have seen for so long is uh, parties and multilateral spaces telling us they don't know what gender transformative uh, actions look like or program look like. And as women and gender constituents, we have taken upon ourselves every year to document at least 20 projects that are gender justice solutions. And the idea is uh, to give parties evidence of what is working, what already community are doing, because it's, it's not fair to constantly think that women and young women are only victim because they are already there doing massive tons of work, but they are not recognized. So my call is and continue to be, rather than putting money to fund project, pilot project, imposed from one country or from global north to global south, why can't we now starting taking a deliberate effort to support local-led gender justice solution, which are there and the evidence are there. So there is no longer excuse of saying, we don't know this project. We can show you uh, where they are and we can connect you to the women and young women who are leading an exceptional work in their communities. Exactly, Ms. Ingano, those, those points were really, concrete and as well very impressive the work that you have been doing the research and in showing that yeah we we are um subject of solutions you know not just victimizing or just um just like that. we are as well not just waiting uh for the support but as well we are waiting as well for more ambition and Somehow I heard a sentence that it says, takes cash to care. <laughs> so in this way, I want to move to part three, uh, which is the role of climate financing, uh, in financing promoting just climate actions. And for this, I want to invite to stage uh, uh, Dr. Gerard Phillips, a manager of climate finance and environment division at African Development Bank. Um, thank you for joining us and to start the conversation. How can we make sure that climate finance promotes climate justice and ensures an inclusive economic development? Great. Well, thank you very much indeed for uh, having me here. And uh, it's a pleasure. I also have to note I'm, I'm not amongst the, the youth on this call uh, and, uh, and have a long history of, uh, of attending the climate negotiations. Um, so let me just start by um, putting the, sort of the, the, the role of women and girls uh, a little bit into perspective. And, uh, and, and forgive me, I mean, I, I tend to sort of, and, and I think often we, we combine women and youth uh, together in, in a lot of our comments and, and statements because some of the problems that they face are the same. But I do want to acknowledge that they're not always the same and there are circumstances where, uh, you know, we, we need to make a clear uh, distinction. Uh, but for the present, for the purposes of my intervention today, um, please consider it a, a broad church, uh, in, including both women and, uh, and youth. So, um, of course, as, uh, um, uh, as uh, Amir at the start said, um, the uh, women are the primary caregivers and home keepers uh, of, uh, of most of the, uh, of the global population. And that already ties them down and makes it very difficult for them to uh, undertake particular activities. In Africa, 70% of the food is grown by women, while only 15% actually own agricultural land and 5% have access to agricultural extension services. Um, so they're uh, broadly discriminated against there. We have 290 million women and girls without access to electricity. 90% of women have informal employment in Africa. So that means only 10% of women actually have formal jobs. 
uh, where um, they, you know, they, they can rely on that as a source of income. And uh, as we've heard from some of the other speakers, uh, Africa is the youngest. Africa is the youngest continent. Currently, around 20% of Africa's population is in the age range of 15 to 24, and the median age on the continent is around 20 years. I also learned recently that there are 44 million micro, small, and medium enterprises in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is an incredible number. They, they, they provide as much as 80 to 90% of the population, sorry, of the employment uh, in some of these uh, countries. Uh, and it means that reaching out to engage uh, with these kinds of institutions is a huge task. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, a little bit later on in one of my sort of final messages. Uh, and um, in the African Development Bank's latest Africa Gender Index, we reported that only 23% of women in Africa have access to credit. And that's a real problem because when you can't access credit or finance, uh, then you can't invest in the technologies that you need to adapt to climate change and to help mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And that keeps women uh, in particular and youth in poverty and in poor situations that they can't move out of. And furthermore, I, I, we also recognize um, the significance of the concept of just transition, which is also built into uh, uh, the text of the Paris Agreement. And we recognize at the African Development Bank that just transition to a low carbon and climate resilient future means that all sectors of society, women, youth, vulnerable people, uh, and so on, they all need to be able to take a share of the opportunities and the burdens associated with this transition to a low carbon and climate resilient future. And at the moment, we don't see that happening in many cases. We see a lot of examples where um, you know, informal groups or, or vulnerable groups are marginalized by activities. And I'll take an example of a you know, clean cooking uh, approach promoting bioethanol or, or natural gas. Uh, it's going to disenfranchise charcoal producers and transporters. And typically we don't look at the impact that our project has on their livelihoods, but that is an example um, of, uh, of, of how we need to broaden the work that we do around just transition to ensure that everybody shares in the opportunities and the benefits. Um, let me just, uh, so I'm going to highlight two activities that we do in the bank about uh, mainstreaming climate change and green growth and, and gender. Uh, we screen all of our projects, our public sector projects against our climate change safeguard systems and for gender equality. Uh, and this is something that has now become a collective responsibility within the African Development Bank. It's taken us a few years to put this in place, but uh, we are now doing this for all of our projects. And it has changed the way, it has influenced the way that we do our projects. And it is starting to influence the way that our regional member countries and our partners uh, implement their projects. So that's a very positive uh, development, but, but it, take it takes time. Uh, and um, uh, let me just then br briefly highlight two initiatives uh, that I want to point out to that are making funding available for women and youth. Uh, the first is a program called the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, or AFAWA, A-F-A-W-A. And the target here is to facilitate up to $5 billion of financing to women-led businesses with a particular focus on agriculture. So $5 billion for, for women-led business, actually that is a quite a significant amount of money. Uh, and this could reach out to a large number of, of small women-led businesses. AFAO is a risk-sharing instrument to unlock credit for women-led businesses and enterprises. And the mechanism builds on an existing network of commercial banks and microfinance institutions to ensure that funds reach young women and women-led businesses. So in other words, it's a line of credit to local commercial banks that says you have to lend money to this particular sector of society. So that's one initiative. And the other one, which is a little bit smaller, but uh, quite exciting, and you'll hear more about it if you come to COP, is the Youth Adaptation Solutions Challenge. Uh, we launched this uh, last year, last September, um, 2021, we just relaunched the 2022 program, and it's an annual competition uh, organized in partnership with the Global Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank. Uh, it's called Youth Adapt, and it offers a prize of $100,000 to innovative, uh, small-scale youth and women-led industries and business opportunities, and provides them with a 12-month business accelerator program. So it's smaller scale, obviously, that there's not, uh, it's not, it's not a five billion scale, but it's an exciting initiative. Uh, and there's a number of these other kinds of um, uh, innovative uh, startup um, launch pads and so on that, that can help. So let me pause there because I don't want to take up too much time and I want to get on to the second question. It's okay. I, I still have a question, um, but I just want to mention that I, I had the, the honor to, um, to see the winners and to get to know the 
uh, the projects of the African Acceleration Program last year at COP. And it's just a lot of innovation. It was so powerful to see youth engaged and proposing ideas, businesses, the knowledge is there. And, and also uh, to thank you as well for, for these opportunities um, for youth. And I hope also this fund in other parts of the world. I think this is fundamental and as well, thank you to the Global Center on Adaptation. And I'm, I'm currently part as well as the Youth Council. So we have been working to expand this. I also wanted to ask you, um, uh, Garrett, uh, regarding how, how especially, and, and, and also like, um, a recommendation of how to ensure that climate finance instruments are designed accurately and especially in terms of accessibility and how you see that climate finance will be addressed at COP27. Yes, so this is, I, and I mean, this is really where, where kind of the, the rubber hits the road a bit. Uh, and, and the bad news is, and, and you know, I, we have to moderate expectations here. It is not easy to access finance. Donors and, and you know, civil society, philanthropies, and so on, they don't give money away for nothing. It is very difficult to mobilize resources. And uh, you know, I have a team of experts working with me here uh, to try to mobilize funds. It's what we do all the time. And you know, I've got people who've spent their careers doing this. It is not easy to mobilize resources. Um, it's particularly hard for young women, uh, for young people and women to access funds because in particular, they rarely have collateral. That means that they don't have assets against which to pledge to borrow money. And, and the most common asset in Africa is land. And women and young people don't own land. So it means they can't access money. Uh, also, uh, because they're young, young people don't have experience. They can't point to a track record and said, I've done this, I've done that, I've succeeded here. So lend me this money now and I'll do more. They can't do that because they're just out of school and, and you know, they're finished education. So it's very challenging for young people to, uh, to, to, to raise money. And when we look at the financial instruments, the international financing instruments that are available in the climate change space, um, and this is typically the international climate funds and, and maybe specifically the green climate fund, you can see that these instruments are designed to work for large scale projects and the kinds of uh, entities that access them are sophisticated international infrastructure funds, uh, uh, engineering companies that build roads and bridges and, and power stations. So those are the kinds of organizations that speak to the existing climate finance architecture. Uh, and uh, the kinds of projects that they develop are you know, typically large scale because it takes a lot of work to mobilize finance. So people don't want to lend just you know, 100,000 or, or a couple of million dollars. They want to lend $50 million because it's the same amount of work. So you know, inevitably, the existing climate finance architecture is skewed towards large scale projects implemented by international engineering companies and so on, and it, not by women and youth in African countries or, or in, other, in, in other developing countries for that matter. Um, and so, the, the, uh, and I think this is a really important message and, and speaking to, 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 uh, to people on this, the, uh, on this call, and I think it was, um, uh, was it Jessica who said, you know, you need to have a message to take to the COP. A really important message to take to the COP and to communicate to your negotiators and your delegations is that the existing climate finance architecture does not work for women and youth. You are never going to be able to access $10 million from the Green Climate Fund. Uh, it, it's, it's a really hard story, but I have to tell you the truth. You need to push to change the architectural structure to enable people who don't have access to uh, collateral uh, and, uh, and people who don't have experience to still access funds. And, I, and I'm going to tell you about two initiatives that we are developing in the African Development Bank specifically to, uh, to tackle this problem. The first is called the Adaptation Benefits Mechanism or ABM. Uh, and you can find more about that at abmechanism.org. And the second is our Green Banks Initiative or the African Green Financing Facility. So, so very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time. On the, um, the Adaptation Benefits Mechanism, this is a, an instrument that invites developed countries and consumers to contribute towards the costs of adaptation projects. And that's important because we're very good at, well, relatively good at contributing towards mitigation. There's lots of money for renewable energy projects, but there isn't much money for adaptation projects um, uh, for, for many reasons. And uh, so through the ABM, we invite consumers and developed countries to contribute towards those costs and to do so by paying for the, the, for, for the delivery of what we call certified adaptation benefits. Now, 
this is again, it's a bit detailed, a bit technical, but it's important to understand. This is what we call a results-based payment instrument. And it means that the purchaser only pays when you deliver the goods. And what that means in practical terms is the project developer takes all the risk. So that is a way to get around the fact that, I, that women and youth don't have collateral and experience. They can say, look, if I can deliver this certified adaptation benefit, you pay me. And we can agree on that basis. We can sign a contract uh, and the adaptation benefit mechanism puts a system in place to enable that to happen. Now, OK, the project developer, the women and youth are still going to have to take the risk and they're going to have to work hard to do that. But at least you can get past this problem of not being able to raise the finance because you don't have the collateral and the experience. So this is a different approach. Uh, it has some similarities to some of the instruments we had under the Kyoto Protocol, uh, but I think most of you are too young to, uh, to remember that, um, so, so I won't go into that. The second initiative is our Green Banks initiative, and, and Green Banks is, is quite a broad term. It, it ranges from uh, a, a national climate fund, uh, for example, Planerwa in Rwanda is a national climate fund that gave grants to, uh, to help technical assistance uh, on, on uh, green projects, green energy projects in particular. Uh, right through to um, you know banks or, or um, a, um, institutions that can mobilize resources and lend money. And the idea is that these are national institutions that will lend money to green or Paris aligned activities and they can have uh, a proportion of those funds to go to, to women and youth uh, and so on. And what's important about these green banks at a national scale is that they can mobilize resources from a number of different places. They can mobilize it from donors, from the Green Climate Fund and from development banks, but they can also mobilize local currency and funds from diaspora uh, and from government raised revenues. Uh, for example, if the government were to put tax on, on particularly, you know, for example, the import of, uh, uh, of fossil fueled engines and so on, then they could, they could use this money. Uh, and we think that this is another really important initiative. There's been many very successful examples of green banks. And in my country, in the UK, they finance the construction of the offshore wind industry. Uh, we're set up specifically to do that. Um, so uh, they, 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 this can be a very um, transformational uh, initiative. So those are two areas, and you can visit our website and learn a little bit more about those. But they are examples that you can take to your negotiators of financial instruments that could change the architecture and enable um, women and youth to access uh, funds. And I want just to make one more point. Um, we don't recognize it, but women and youth bring very important ingredients, particularly to adaptation projects. Women and women agriculturalists in particular, they are the guardians of our agricultural biodiversity. They are the ones who know about the crops and the varieties and the seeds. They collect them, they protect them, and they grow them, and they know and understand them. You cannot develop adaptation projects without land, labor, entrepreneurial spirit, access to biodiversity, and access to local government structures. Of course, the other thing you need is money. The Green Climate Fund has the money, but they don't have any of the other ingredients. And the women and youth bring those ingredients. And we need to bring that to the table and say, that's what we have to contribute to this initiative. Let me stop there. Gareth, thank you. Thank you very much for all those kind of perspectives. And unfortunately, Yes, I think as, as a young person and, and, uh, and women from indigenous communities, I, I hear a lot about climate financing and everything, but true, like how to get to access to that, you know, it's, it's a long process and it's also to get to know and to, to change as well that, that, that is structure, but as well how we, you know, as, as well as part kind of the, 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 in the negotiation process, how we as well make our governments aware about this and even about literacy, clim uh, literacy in climate um, finance is fundamental. Sometimes we, we think that we know the terms and how we are talking, but then it's, it's, it's very, you know, different sometimes from what we think it is and what it is. Um, I also want to take advance and uh, there is a common question in the in the QA and it's like uh, we want um, it's uh, Ahmed uh, Mohammed Suleiman he said that he like he's expressing that they want uh, communication channels uh, with the African Development Bank that support the startup so how, how will be I, I'm going to rephrase kind of the question how will be kind of the way for example I have a prayer let's say uh, I, I'm my own person um, in an Africa country, and I want to reach um, the bank. How how will this be this process? Like, what do you advise to to set a, a communication channel, kind of with the different banks as well? 
Yes. So, so it's interesting. I get this asked this question many times, especially from from young audiences. And the answer, I'm sorry, my answer is really disappointing, and it never satisfies anybody. The African Development Bank. First of all, we're not a venture capital bank, so you know we don't give money to 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 sort of new ideas and concepts to try to help them uh, develop and so on. And we can't work with with individual um, uh, entrepreneurs and people with ideas and, and or, you know who are looking for a loan. You need to go to a local commercial bank uh, and try to find somebody who will lend you money. Uh, um, you know, for example, um, I mentioned the Afawa. I'm sorry, Ahmed, uh, obviously you're, you're a man, not a woman. So Afawa was for women-led businesses. Um, uh, I don't know if there's, there's, you know, if there are other initiatives um, that, that focus on, uh, on, on sort of startup companies. I'm sure there are. Uh, there's also these innovation platforms, uh, launch pads and so on. Uh, I know that there's a number that are run in different countries, like the, the Youth Adapt program uh, that I mentioned. Uh, so these are opportunities to, to look for. But uh, it's very difficult to, to raise funds. And, you know, I mean, if we were able to create green banks uh, in African countries, then this would be a role that the green banks could take on. They could make money available each year for startup innovation uh, and provide um, sort of capacity building and support to help young entrepreneurs get started with businesses. But the African Development Bank, you know, we can't do it. I mean, you know, uh, even our smallest fund that, that gives grants to uh, civil society and uh, NGOs and so on, our minimum grant is $250,000. Uh, and, uh, you know, so so it's no good coming to us to, to ask for support, you know, for some for a small startup business. I'm sorry, we can't help you. Thank you. I think it's 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 important as well to to address it honestly, but also to invite um, youth and to check about these programs uh, that you mentioned as well. They they can support as a framework and even in order to address uh, your government. Uh, many governments are all you know open to suggestions and to even advice on, on climate finance. Um, Thank you very much. So yes, we are now at the Q and A uh, session. Uh, we already had some several questions answered in the chat. Uh, we are going to be. If you have questions, please, this is the moment to to comment. Um, if you want to explore uh, part of the conversation that is still uh, you know unclear for you, go ahead and send us a, a question. But I also want to. Uh, as to Mira, actually, I think we talk about uh, the different perspectives, uh, but I want to go back, especially on indigenous communities, because this is kind of one uh, one part that sometimes is, is unexplored regarding the this uh, nexus in gender and energy, and is um, what are cultures of care and how they are related to, to climate justice. I think this is something that we really need to discuss today before we finish the, the webinar. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, I talked about earlier that we need a cultural shift if we have to see any semblance of climate justice in the world. And there, for me, solidarity and care as values are very important, but also important as structures and systems and how communities are organized. And this is where Indigenous peoples come in because of how they organize care and how they organize within their bioregions and um, the relationship they have and the knowledge they have, the traditional knowledge that's been passed down through generations, which um, the scientific community doesn't acknowledge as science, but it is a traditional environmental indigenous science um, that helps us understand how to be in relationship with each other, with other beings on this planet, and also with um, um, our environment. Um, and this is where I think um, why I talk about care is because if we center care as not just a value, but it, within our systems and structures, then our relationships uh, with um, those around us and the elements around us will change. Um, it's going uh, away from a relationship where we see um, our environment and uh, things around us as resources. Um, rather than something that we are meant to be in relationship with. When you see things as commodities or resources, then, then it's um, automatic to extract from it. And it's automatic to consume more of it. And so it's about a shift in perspective, shift in paradigm. Um, and for me, um, I learn a lot 
uh, from indigenous cultures and the knowledge and the traditions that they hold and what they've passed down, because I think those are some of the solutions that we need to relearn as society is large. Um, these are things that we've marginalized on purpose. Again, because of colonization, a lot of erasure has happened when it comes to indigenous knowledge and traditions and local knowledge and traditions. And this is why I say that um, women and non-binary trans people, because uh, they've been struggling and even youth um, have been struggling uh, against these systems of oppression, which Mishi named, um, and I'll name them again, patriarchy, neoliberalism, imperialism, uh, white supremacy, ableism, um, and cis het no normativity, it's really, really important to understand that when people are struggling and resisting these systems of oppression, they not only become resilient, but they come up with solutions uh, to fight back and they understand their needs and they are better prepared and equipped to help us come to solutions that are necessary for us to get to a place where we can say, yes, we're getting closer to climate justice. So like um, she also said that um, the UNFCCC, uh, the negotiation spaces aren't really a feminist space, aren't really a space where indigenous knowledge is centered, aren't a space where youth have access as Jessica, Jessica also mentioned. So um, it has um, its problems, but sadly it's the only space we have where everyone can gather. So I think what we need is to push for more inclusion um, of uh, observers in the negotiations that maybe it should be expanded beyond a party process uh, because often party representatives aren't representatives of their people. They're also uh, at times educated middle class elite that represent their countries. So it's really, really important that we have the right people um, informing the process and making decisions on their own behalf. So for me, it's about um, this shift in relationships, relationships with each other and the relationship with uh, our environment and relationship with other beings. And that's where care is central. So thank you for asking that. Sure, thank you. I, I think it's um, whenever exploring this nexus, we realize that also like respecting our paradigms, our cosmoviews is fundamental as well. Um, we have uh, obviously an international system, but back into our communities, the modus operandi is different in bringing, you know, this knowledge. Some, some of the times when I talk about adaptation, the story is that even my, my grandma used to talk to me about how they used to cultivate water. And you're like, come on. And nowadays those options are, again, being very used to face climate change and they are innovations. They are millionaire innovations. So I just wanted to explore about this. And um, some of the questions as well, I, I want to uh, notice that I uh, mentioned that uh, several of our lecturers have answered the questions already in the QA session. So please um, um, take a look if, um, if you have additional questions, but also I also want to uh, explore a little bit uh, with Jessica um about if you could just tell us more about this uh network uh of world's youth the climate for just uh, climate justice and how our participants can get involved yes happily and uh, thank you for the question um so world's youth for climate justice as i said uh, is taking the biggest problem to the highest courts um, but this movement started in the pacific actually already um in 2011 a uh, climate vulnerable uh, Pacific island state of Palau attempted to take this to the uh, International Court of Justice to seek clarifications on the obligations of states to cut their greenhouse gas emission to avoid transboundary harm. Uh, let's hope we haven't crossed the most of the boundaries yet. Um, but this attempt was uh, unsuccessful and afterwards came the 2015 Paris Agreement um, where states could voluntarily um, contribute to the reduction uh, of emissions. Um, and then in 2019, so not that long ago, uh, 27 law students uh, of the University of the South Pacific learned about this case and were very inspired by the initiative. Um, and they set up the organization Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change, also one you should definitely look up um, and they have built upon Palau's idea. Um, so to focus human rights and, and climate change 
and uh, table the proposal. This was done uh, now by uh, Vanuatu and other island states. Um, and the World Youth for Climate Justice is a campaign that has joined this effort uh, to amplify because what is needed is a majority of member states of the UN to vote uh, yes to getting an advisory opinion. Uh, so for example, right now there is the UNGA General Assembly and there are a lot of actions going on and people informing uh, the delegations there to hopefully as the votes will happen sometime soon, um, vote yes, uh, but also again to urge your national delegations. So to have these movements in different countries. Um, yeah. And we believe that this advisory opinion on climate change will not just uh, summarize the state's existing obligations, but also spur progressive action um, and give a interpretation of those obligations um, to make global progress. And um, yeah, I'm going to share a link of the campaign and uh, yeah, please, everyone is very, very welcome to join these efforts. Thank you. I was about to ask you, like, just share the link so you know they can get in contact and in case as well they have more questions and perspectives. So I um, we have a couple of minutes left, and um, as well to Mrs. Singano, uh, but do you want to tell to our, our audience regarding gender responsive climate action and why it is so important that gender and climate action uh, movement is supported by young men, <laughs> non-binary and young women equally? And as well, this will be kind of answering as well one of the questions that was as well on the chat regarding this matter. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I strongly feel that we need everyone to solve climate uh, crisis that we are, uh, we have now, and we need those in the power to take uh, heavy responsibilities. And this include those who are in the power and those who have resources uh, to take responsibilities. And this include, for example, Global North, uh, and also this include men uh, and men in position of power, men in position of leadership to take responsibilities to address climate justice. So we, uh, I strongly believe we should not be in a position to say uh, it's only this one group because what we have, we are to continue to see that uh, is we are putting a lot of burden on women to address the crisis that they have not solved. Uh, and we are asking men to support while they should be taking responsibility to undo the crisis they have caused. So to me, I don't think this is the question of support rather than this is the question to do the right thing uh, because they are, uh, in, most, in most cases, they're the one who have uh, contributed to this crisis. Uh, but also by extension, this world is for all of us. So when, when, the, when the hurricane hit or extreme event happened, they don't choose gender. Of course, uh, those who have least uh, resources to adapt, to be rescued, will be mostly impacted. But at the end of the day, we are all impacted, as the IPCC report has shown that we are all uh, impacted. We all have to take those responsibilities. And I think... Uh, in that context of how now we've been intentional, including, for example, non-binary person, because we do know in most cases, in most community, these are, are colleagues and folks that are not recognized. Their fundamental rights have been taken away from them to begin with. So we have, for example, experience when uh, um, community are compensated for uh, lost harvest. Those who doesn't own land, they don't compensate. So if you are not known, uh, if uh, the uh, your reality is not being shared, your rights are not respected, uh, you are not being prioritized, your voices are not being heard, and your needs are not being addressed. So it's important for all of us who are in the pos uh, have attained certain privilege, and that's including me, to be mindful of. Who am I representing? When am I representing? And at what stage do I have to take, uh, to get out of the stage, to allow that stage to be taken by someone else whose need needs to be prioritized, or whose voices need to be heard? And this is invitation for our uh, brothers, uh, especially men, to also do the same because we 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 still and we'll be go to to Egypt. We we'll still see hundreds of panels, which are all men panels. 
or they'll have one young woman and that will be it. Or they call one woman moderator and that will be it. So it's a call uh, not for them to support us, but to be intentional in opening up spaces for all of us to be represented. Thank you. Really explore what representativity means. And I think those reflections are really fundamental in our daily life, in our work, and also be young cough. Right. So last but not least, I want as well to, to call Mr. Garrett again. And um, there is a question as well on, on, on where are uh, best practice and malpractice examples of climate finance projects. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, so this is it's very difficult to pull out uh, examples of malpractice. Uh, I mean, we have projects that um, you know that, that sometimes don't don't work. Uh, you know, we learn lessons uh, uh, from uh, um, you know from the design and implementation of projects, and we have evaluation programs that go back and allow us to uh, correct uh, future design uh, and so on. Um, so, so I think you know I can't really highlight any particular areas there, but. Um, we have had challenges in mobilizing climate finance, uh, particularly from the Green Climate Fund, um, where you know, we've spent a lot of time preparing documentation. Um, this is not, we're not the only ones this has happened to, it, where uh, you know, it goes through their internal approval process and then gets rejected by the independent technical advisory panel. Uh, and um, I, I say, you know, this is the, an example of, of uh, you know, of malpractice, but it's an area where. The, you know, we can point to that the, the sort of the climate finance instruments aren't working uh, and they're not enabling us to, uh, you know, to mobilize the resources quickly enough. And in terms of, uh, I think, you know, sort of the good practice uh, and, and um, you know, the uh, successes that we have seen, uh, I, I think I can talk uh, more generally about the bank, the African Development Bank's overall role in mobilizing climate finance. Uh, last year, we mobilized $3.6 billion uh, of finance. Um, which was in excess of 40% of the bank's total climate financing uh, activities. Now, again, it's a bit technical. Um, we have methodologies that we use to identify uh, what is climate finance and what is not. But back in 2015 or 2016, we only managed 9% of our finance as climate finance. So uh, that's a big uh, increase. Uh, and that means that you know, we've succeeded in changing the focus of uh, the kinds of projects that the bank is developing and supporting uh, to increasingly uh, build in and recognize climate benefits. And within that target of, um, I think it was 41%, uh, then 63% of that finance was allocated to adaptation projects uh, and 37 to mitigation. And that uh, for the bank is, is quite a success because um, generally, uh, institutions find it difficult to allocate funds to adaptation projects uh, because, uh, for example, adaptation projects generally don't deliver revenues, so they're difficult to finance. Uh, you need more grants uh, or highly concessional funds uh, to enable adaptation projects to work. So we've done a lot around adaptation, particularly climate resilient agriculture, food security and uh, water and sanitation. Uh, for irrigation and uh, potable water supplies uh, and so on. Those are all uh, classed as adaptation projects. So I would say, uh, you know, that's one of the big successes uh, that the bank has had over the past few years. And looking forward, I hope that the instruments that I mentioned earlier, the Adaptation Benefits Mechanism and the Green Banks uh, initiatives will become, um, uh, you know, examples of, of, of innovative instruments that have addressed challenges and helped to mobilise uh, resources so that in a few years' time, people will be able to refer to those as uh, examples of good practice. Thank you. Thank you again. A lot of concepts, lots of ideas now, how we're going to put this into practice. So I want to invite now to Alois uh, Malanga, who is um, going to give us some closing perspectives. He's the Chief of Climate Technology and Innovation Divisions at UNIDE. Um, Alois, please. Go ahead. Um, which is gracias, uh, Joyce. And um, I wanted to take this opportunity to really, first of all, thank all the participants for your active participation. Uh, this has been quite an exciting um, 
EE session uh, with a lot of inputs, comments, and suggestions. And I also want to, to take this opportunity to also thank our speakers and the co-organizers from Joyce, uh, Mira, and I, I had the privilege of working in Pakistan, and I see the devastation that climate change is having, and I'm quite uh, touched by what is what is going on. Uh, Gareth from the African Development Bank, uh, Jessica, um, uh, Mwana Hamisi, and uh, also Amir. <clears throat> um, I'm going to try uh, this incredible task of uh, summarizing the rich conversations that we have had so far. And it is uh, quite interesting. So what I'm just going to do is uh, to highlight to mention some of the highlights that were mentioned by the different speakers. I think Amir was uh, quite clear in the, I mean, by highlighting that climate change exacerbates the challenges that are already being faced by women. Women are facing challenges because they are responsible for unpaid work, existing discrimination systems, and also they manage household activities. So, but women are fast adopters, they are meticulous and they're diligent. So they can be the agents of change uh, from households all the way to boardrooms. And we need to promote gender sensitive perspectives. We need uh, women's voice in all platforms to hear them rather than to tell them uh, how they can be part of this climate change uh, conversation. Education and behavior change and women and climate change. And also we need to accelerate innovations that are based on and helping women to participate um, in the climate change conversation to address both their practical needs and strategic needs. I'm going to go to Mira. Mira was very clear that um, uh, our generation has witnessed the greatest uh, technological transformation and that uh, the historical marginalization and barriers are making um, climate change much more impactful to developing countries than developed countries. And to get to justice, we need to, 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 to talk to people to deliver locally driven solutions that are uh, designed by communities. Gender equality should be anchored in the broader context of the climate crisis and broader economic systems and the need to rethink or destroy or address the, some of the vestiges of capitalism and colonialism should also come central to this conversation. Loss and damage should be prioritized and money that is coming and support that is coming to developing countries uh, it comes with a lot of strings, technologies are uh, provided without patents. So we should focus on a solidarity and care-based, um, I mean, a support system that uh, addresses the needs of rural communities, the LGBT communities, the youth, and the indigenous communities. So we need this, I mean, a, a cultural shift and uh, to address uh, the issue of climate change. And Jessica was quite clear in the fact that everyone is affected by climate change, both in the north and the global south, but not everyone is affected the same. I, I remember reading some some days um, ways back I read on uh, a book on animal farm that all animals are equal but others are more equal than others and I think this talks to the issue of climate change. Um, the resource consumption by industrialized countries was actually responsible for driver for climate change and the inequality that it causes. Youth are half the population under 30 and uh, underrepresented in economic and political conversations on climate change and mentioned that um, as a begin, to begin with, we need to meet the hundred billion dollar um, play, per year pledge, and also mention that um, some African negotiators are also now focusing on one point three million trillion US dollars for I mean to, to address the loss and damage. And climate change is not an option. You mentioned interesting figures that COP twenty six there were over twenty six uh, thirty thousand participating in Glasgow, in which shows that to some extent uh, youth are mobilized. And he uh, mentioned that youth should join movement and, to, and organize, and there's no need to create new movements, but to join existing movements so that you can amplify uh, the roles and concerns of women and youth in the, the climate change conversation. Uh, Mwana Hamisi mentioned that uh, climate change is at the heart, I mean, of, um, at the heart of climate change is the issue of injustice, and that uh, those responsible for climate change are better equipped yet those that are not responsible are least equipped to respond. 
And so we need to get to, to address climate change in, 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 in this uh, dynamic between North, South, rural, urban, and all the divides that we are facing, our societies are, our society is facing. Feminists need to change systems to, um, of oppression, by patriarchy, and uh, capitalism. Also, I think you should mention that um, women have demonstrated exceptional leadership in fighting climate change. So we need to build on these success stories to ensure that we are able to, to, to amplify and address um, climate change in such a manner that women are at the center of the actions. I am I mean, someone who went for African Development Bank before. I, I mean, I, 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 I sort of, I was, I mean, I'm impressed by the statistics that were mentioned by Gary that uh, women are 70% are sent, are responsible for 70% of the food that is produced, yet only 15% on land and 5% of access to agriculture extension service. This, that's this sort of I mean, inequality transcend all other economic sectors, energy and everything. So, and also the fact that 44 million MSMEs are in Sub-Saharan Africa and 80% and they provide 80% of the employment. So access to credit is very limited because they, I mean, women and the youth, they don't have the track record, they don't have the, 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 the credit, they don't have the, uh, the security. So. We need, I mean, some of the recommendations that comes from, from Garrett were that, I mean, we, um, I mean, the existing financial, I mean, existing climate finance infrastructure needs to be challenged to ensure that uh, more and more support is given to women and projects that are centered on the needs of women. And you mentioned some of the initiatives that the African Development Bank is uh, embarking on that include the AFAWA, that uh, where 5 billion is being provided to women-led businesses to, I mean, to access credit and also the Youth Adaptation Solution Challenge that you're organizing with the Global, uh, a, 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 a global I mean, a Commission on Climate Adaptation. And I mean, in, this has been quite a rich uh, discussion and I really appreciate all the inputs. Uh, what is left for me is also to share with you that in Inido, gender and economic empowerment of women is central to all the activities that we have. All the projects are screened on gender. Our climate change strategy is premised on the need for uh, I mean, equality, the need to address the differentiated I mean, um, challenges that people face, the communities face due to climate change. If, the issue, if you are interested in the issue of loss and damage, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to the next session, which is going to be organized on, the, the, on August uh, 13. Uh, once again, thank you so much. This has been an enriching discussion. I really want to appreciate all the presenters and the organizers and all the participants. Muchas gracias. Merci bien. Thank you very much for um, that great uh, conclusion uh, and abstract. It was indeed very rich and I invite the participants. Um, I believe you will be receiving the link uh, of the recording. So if you want to go ahead and listen again, some parts and parts of the webinar, just go ahead and do it. I think it's um, fundamental to connect. So some of the lecturers have shared a lot of projects or even their organizations in order to reach to them in case for further questions. But honestly, thank you very much for your work as well. Um, either to our listeners, but as well to our lecturers for your time. I know uh, the agenda is getting a little bit busy before COP, but it's fundamental to have these reflections, these spaces for sharing globally these different perspectives. So from my side, I just want to thank you. I, invite, I also invite you to be um, uh, uh, link and also to check social medias for UNIDO for the following webinars as well. And last but not least, I think global action and, and, and climate action needs to, as I said, to have a global perspective and local action um, and listening. Let's listen to also our ancestors. And I also want to leave you with a question, actually. How do you think you will be a good ancestor? And especially tackling this, this gender and energy and, and, and uh, gender. How will you be a good ancestor? Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for this space and see you until the next time. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, everyone.